Welcome to everyone tuning in tonight on Zoom and on Facebook. My name is Robin Brown, and I'm the co-host of Off the Hill, Rebel.ca's political commentary panel discussion. Off the Hill addresses current issues of national significance from a progressive and critical viewpoint. Uh, this is my first night as host, and I'm uh, excited to be here with our fantastic panelists. Uh, we have Carl Nuremberg, Rebel's award-winning political correspondent, Leah Gazan, member of parliament for Winnipeg Center, and our special guest, uh, economist Chukka Jekum, writer and policy researcher working in British Columbia's labor movement. You'll also get to hear from my alternating co-host of Off the Hill, Libby Davies, at the end of the panel. Um, but unfortunately, you only get to see me now because I've been having a bit of technical problem, so I'm just gonna turn off my video, you'll hear my voice, but all good. So let's jump right in. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, you can participate in the chat or ask questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. And we'll do our best to address your questions. And for those of you watching on Facebook, welcome. All right, um, last time we met in, in, on Off the Hill uh, was on the eve of the federal budget, the first budget in over two years and the first since the pandemic began. Not long after, on April 26th, Global News shared an Ipsos poll they commissioned suggesting Canadians barely noticed, uh, noticed the federal budget. Here is some of what the poll said. Quote, what the data shows is that Canadians are so preoccupied by what they're dealing with relative to the pandemic that the budget almost seemed like an interruption. An awful lot of what Canadians are focused on has to do almost exclusively with getting people access to vaccines and getting their lives back to normal people felt the budget didn't really speak directly to those questions. An even larger majority of those, 79%, said they felt the budget will neither help or hurt them personally. Now, of course, we don't know exactly who they reached with the poll, but whatever you think of this poll, what we do know is that the pandemic has deeply exacerbated precarious work situations for essential workers, including migrant workers, those in the food industry, service workers, part-time workers, non-unionized workers, racialized indigenous and women workers. So let's get into it. Let's get to our first question tonight. Uh, did workers get the help they needed in the budget? Let's talk about how employment security was addressed, conditions of work, paid sick days, employment insurance, loss of income. Uh, Leo, let's start with you. you. You recently introduced a motion in parliament for a permanent guaranteed livable basic income that would help address these concerns. Do you think the budget uh, delivered on that? Well, absolutely not. Uh, you know, I've, I think it's no secret. I've been pushing for a guaranteed livable basic income for those who don't have one. Um, we already have income guarantees uh, in this country. Uh, OAS is an example of a guaranteed income, not livable. Uh, students, I got it. Uh, by the pandemic, unable to get employment, uh, it's, a, it's not okay that even students in this country uh, live in poverty as a long-time post-secondary uh, educator, uh, seniors. 70% uh, of adults with intellectual disabilities live in poverty. Uh, this is not acceptable. So what my motion proposed was to ensure a guaranteed livable basic income for all, um, and, and to make current income guarantees livable and expand them out to, to the many people that are falling, uh, falling through the cracks. And as we see the pandemic uh, mm -hmm. continue, uh, we're in year two of the pandemic, uh, people are not only getting their SERP cut, uh, but now, you know, losing their income, we now see people on the verge of being uh, unsheltered. I'm really proud that our party has been calling for Serb amnesty, and there's no reason why we can't have it. Look at the billions of dollars that they've given to corporations, the $18 billion to the oil and gas industry. And I, I've said this many times, $12 million to law laws, all the corporate bailouts that happened and continue to happen during the pandemic, yet artists are living uh, on, on the margins. Uh, they're so certainly not part of this uh, current uh, budget, anybody in the gig economy. Um, so I think, you know, we see the same sort of liberal story, which is helping their rich friends, uh, nothing in the budget of having the ultra rich 
pay for the debt. It's going to fall on the backs of people. So there's all sorts of gaps in this budget. Uh, certainly uh, the investments, um, uh, even in pharmacare, voting against pharmacare for Pete's sakes. I mean, we see all sorts of disappointments, not surprised. I think the one highlight, ha it certainly is the heavy investments in childcare. But again, we've been waiting over 29 uh, or 28 years for them to keep that promise. And, and this time I know that the industry, the childcare workers and advocates around the country are happy. I hope this time the Liberals actually um, keep that promise um, and we'll make sure to hold them to that. Great, thanks Liam. Um, and trial care, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be getting to that later on actually too. Carl, do you think the budget delivery for people who need it most? Well, the budget basically is very, very forward looking. It's essentially a political campaign document designed to launch an election campaign that the uh, Liberals have been planning to have this spring and then couldn't do because of the pandemic. Uh, so there's really very little immediate except to keep some of the supports that have been going going longer as temporary pandemic supports and even those are winding down that the, the Canada recovery benefit is reduced from 500 to 300 mm -hmm. uh, and so there is really there are a number of uh, measures there's a, a benefit that goes to work uh, income support to workers uh, and there's there there are all kinds of measures designed to increase economic activity and partnership with business, how much we'll get to workers are not sure, sure. But there's extremely little that's very immediate uh, and direct. This is essentially because child, so we have a childcare program. Don't forget that has to happen over time in negotiation with the provinces. So it is really the beginning of a long process. I've you've rarely seen a budget announce so much spending that will happen after not not during the life of this government, maybe not even during the life of the next government. It'll happen 10, 15, you know, it'll happen far in the future. So in terms of the immediate needs of people, um, th there's a good reason that people tell pollsters they don't think it's gonna change their lives very much because they're right, that, 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 they've, uh, that they've actually figured it out. All right, no thanks, Carol. Chuka, what's your take on this? Um, I think that I, I would say, um, Unequivocally, the answer is no. I mean, I think that there are, are two primary things that could be said to support workers in this critical time or sort of overall. One would be a reduction in the necessary lines upon wage labor uh, or effectively a an increase in the guarantee to which people have uh, access to the resources required to live a meaningful and uh, uh, fulfilling human life, right? The education, healthcare, um, shelter, social connection, all of those things that are absolutely essential. The fact that employment um, security is so important is because employment is generally the way that we access those things. So the degree to which the, the or I don't feel that the budget meaningfully reduces the sort of structural reliance upon wage labor, I think as well as uh, Leah mentioned, the 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 fact that you know certain groups especially experience poverty demonstrates the sort of deeply uh, patriarchal and ableist nature in our society and that if you aren't uh, sort of contributing in this very sort of medieval sense and I would say, that I, I would say uh, then you aren't sort of deemed a valuable member and therefore you aren't sort of granted that uh, kind of the recognition of your existence um, I think and I think the other the other aspect is that the from my perspective the budget does not um, meaningfully challenge the kind of economic assumptions that have uh, framed politics over the last 40 years and uh, that the, the economic policies that were pursued globally by the, during the pandemic have called into question. I don't think that the, the budget uh, address or contests those presumptions significantly enough. And I feel that contest, contesting those presumptions would produce greater benefits for people. All right, Th thanks, Sugar. thanks all. Um, I can just stay with you, Sugar. Um, um, like black uh, Canadians were disproportionately hit hard by COVID at the same time as uh, the global Black Lives Matter protests following the murder of George Floyd. Um, actually, let's just stick with, we'll, we'll actually go with Carl. Carl, the federal budget specifically allocated dollar, dollars for initiatives for black Canadians for the first time. What, what do you make of that? Well, it's a very small amount and almost a token amount. And one really has to think that if you wanted to help black Canadians, you'd have to look at all the areas where black people work. And again, dis disproportionately in, in um, unstable work situations and work that's not guaranteed long-term, 
in part-time and temporary work, at work situations and look at that more broadly. So it's hard to imagine that uh, tens of million dollars here and there, it'll have some impact on helping develop some uh, black small businesses, but really it's very difficult to sift out um, one group or another in dealing with the economy and dealing with social groups in the economy. And you have to look more broadly. I would say that, that in order to get a measure of that issue, oddly, you should look at what they're doing for gig economy workers. And um, I invite people to take the budget and do a keyword search through the budget for the word gig worker. You see, it occurs about 20 times, except it never says anything in particular. It says, we really are worried about these people and think that one day we should do something about it. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you something. Gig workers in 2016 were something like 8.2% of the workforce. Um, and that had be, had increased over the three year uh, period, you know, over three years prior to that by 3% or 4%. Well, now we can be pretty sure they're probably over 10% of the workforce. And, and the pandemic has made it much more severe. And there's really very, very little. If you're a person who has to take some kind of casual contract work of various kinds, there's very, very little for you there. Temporarily, there was the CERB that recognized these people need support was everybody else. But then the rest of it, again, it's we're gonna have a process to study legislation to protect the rights of gig workers. You know, when the government wanted to give a lot of money to the Friends of the Wheat Charity, they did that in a weekend. They figured out how to do that on a, over a weekend. And they've made a very, when they wanted to come up with an infrastructure bank, which was a hobby horse of the previous finance minister and was advised by their big business um, consultants, they did that almost overnight. When they do want to make something happen, they can make it happen, but they're not making enough happen. So if you want to look at what's happening with black Canadians, look at what's happening with people generally in the lower income group and okay. people generally the less stable workforce. All right, I want to bring Chuka back into this. Chuka, what do you think? Did the budget include enough for black Canadians and in the right places? Um, I mean, certainly, again, no, without question, the answer is no. Um, I think that uh, when considering sort of structural inequities that are excited, that are, persist in our society, you know, the inequities experienced by, by Black Canadians don't emerge out of a vacuum. And so addressing them requires addressing the sort of structural causes for them, right? The, the embedded inequities that create the expressions of inequity that we see in, in access to housing and wealth disparities in criminal justice outcomes or uh, carceral outcomes, things like that. And I, one, I don't believe that the government has that perspective on those sort of structural issues. I don't, I don't believe that they... I. Um, accurately identify uh, causes and distinguish them from expressions. And uh, two, I don't think that even if they were to, to hold that perspective, I don't think that the things in their budget actually even begin to address those kind of deep seated uh, um, uh, structures that, that sort of cause these inequities and that inform both domestic but international policy. You know, the, the practices that create or the practices that have led to, the, sorry, the historical currents that have led to the inequities within Canada are the same that have led to the inequities globally that Canada um, propagates and benefits from. Okay, thanks, Joker. Um, all right, seeing as uh, the audience knows that we keep a tight ship here, it's 45 minutes, so we're gonna move on to our, fi our final question before going to audience questions. Um, uh, let's bring Leah back then. Leah, uh, the government made big promises on childcare, but will their commitments uh, change anything for precarious workers and will a national program be, effected, uh, be de effectively delivered anytime soon? Yeah. Well, I mean, we had issues prior to the pandemic and uh, they've worsened as a result of the pandemic. I wanna uh, talk a little bit about migrant workers and paid sick leave. If you look at what's going in Manitoba, we are in a health crisis. We're sending people to Ontario. We've run out of ICU beds. The majority of people that are contracting COVID um, are um, workers. Uh, we don't have proper paid sick leave uh, in this country. Uh, the government hasn't really promised a, a real plan. And a, a, a population that's been really impacted in terms of essential workers have been migrant workers. And, 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 I, and I bring this up because it's a massive issue. The fact that although even, even um, though the government uh, announced uh, spots 
uh, for permanent residency, they've excluded all essential workers, essential workers that have put their lives on the line uh, during the pandemic, their lives and their families' uh, lives on the line with, with very little acknowledgement, which is why I'm really supportive of this Status for All campaign. Uh, to make sure that all Canadians can benefit from rights. And we talk about childcare and, you know, going back to childcare, but let's not forget that refugee families in this country do not even benefit from the child tax benefit. They do not get the child tax benefit. They can get social assistance, but they don't get the child tax benefit. This is wild, hugely problematic and, and places families in very deep, deep levels of poverty. We have uh, systems in place that perpetuate systemic racism. I, I would argue that the child tax benefit, limiting access uh, to refugees from accessing it, uh, what's gone on in First Nations, we know the 10th non-compliance order with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling to immediately stop racially discriminating against First Nations kids on reserve. We see nothing in the budget for them to rectify it. In fact, I put in a um, question of privilege to find out how much this government has budgeted in this budget to fight Indigenous peoples in courts because they spend at least 500 to a million or 500 to a billion dollars a year fighting Indigenous peoples in courts annually. And we know another group hard hit women. Uh, we know an essential part to make sure that women can join the workforce is a robust child care system, uh, you know, with national, you know, and uh, so I really heed the calls of a child advocate, child care advocates, as a former child care worker, in fact, uh, many years uh, ago, uh, to make massive investments in, this, in the system. And if this government claims to be a feminist government, then they better heed their promise and invest in child care. Because without doing that, I really question the legitimacy on a number of other levels that this government truly is a feminist government. Mm -hmm. And what about, and do you think that this national program that they're promising will be effectively delivered anytime soon? Well, I mean, they've made this promise for 20, 28 years, and I don't want to take away the um, excitement that has come from uh, child care advocates from across the country. All I can say is that I do still believe that this government, if it does go through, it needs to be pushed. But I, I, but I agree with Carl. I think this was a pre-election a budget campaign announcement. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can push this through very quickly uh, to make sure they finally keep their promise. I, they were making the same promises when I was in childcare. Uh, it's been, and it's, it was many years ago. We're going on 29 years. Childcare workers, essential workers, they deserve to have a living wage. Uh, you know, parents and families caregivers deserve to be able to make a real choice of working or staying home uh, and not be limited by by uh, barriers to a good quality public child care. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed, uh, you know, and I certainly will be pushing for that. Okay. Um, Chuka, in, in your April rebel column, you, you question how the government framed its decision to invest in childcare. As they said, the investment would pay for itself by boosting the post-pandemic economy. But you raise concerns about this framing. Why, why is that? Um, I just think that it uh, neglect or omits some of the benefits that a, a well-funded and comprehensive childcare program would produce. And it... Um, justifies it in a way that makes the program very vulnerable. First, I think that the contributions of a child care program isn't just the increased economic freedom of women, which obviously is, is absolutely essential and the government must invest in it, um, but the government deserves, the government must invest in that and provide a comprehensive child care program, right? The two things are not completely identical and to to say that the only investment in the economic uh, empowerment of women is a child care program is to in some way essentialize women as as caregivers or mothers which obviously we, we would argue against um, 
Additionally, to say that the program would, in presenting the program, to say that it will pay for itself, it allows, it creates a vulnerability in that if the program doesn't produce the, the sort of GDP boost that you have claimed that it would, then it calls into question whether or not the program is worthwhile. Is it, should it still be pursued if it doesn't, quote unquote, pay for itself? So I think that it uh, improperly or inaccurately identifies the benefits of a program and it unnecessarily creates vulnerabilities. All right, thanks, Joe. Definitely. All right, folks. Um, now we're going to go. Actually, thank you very much for the, the great answers to those questions. We're going to go to some audience questions uh, right now, and we have one uh, actually right here from um, this from an audience member um, Sandra Curry asking. She wonders how women's unpaid, underpaid, and essential services were addressed in this budget. Who wants to jump in and take that one? I'd like to talk about the JLBI. I think care work, I mean, there's there's certain work that is not respected in capitalist systems. I would argue that care work uh, is one uh, kind of work that is just not uh, respected in capitalist systems and, and, and also art. Uh, you know, <laughs> capitalist systems are not designed to, to respect the, the critical, dire, uh, in essential um, work of artists. Um, you know, which is why one of the reasons why I pushed for that guaranteed livable basic income. Uh, you know, there's so many people, so, so much work that happens, mostly by women, that is unpaid work, that is devalued in, in capitalist system. So I, you know, I think uh, this, this budget perpetuates the norm of devaluating this kind of work, care work, uh, critical work. Um, and I don't see anything, ch any sort of change in this budget, unfortunately. Uh, let's go, Carl. Anything to add? I think the thing that, that's important to remember, I'm not trying to defend this government or any federal government, but we live in a federal system where the provinces are very, very powerful. Where they control a great deal of what happens in people's lives. The education systems, the healthcare systems, and most of labor. Most, of, mo most workers are regulated by their provincial governments, not by the federal government. So in a sense, Leah's argument that what the federal government could do, where it has carved a space out for itself historically and can continue to act, is in direct income support to everybody, in direct payments to everybody. The federal government has taken on that role. I mean, people may not realize it, but in 1940, they actually had to amend the constitution to allow the federal government to bring in unemployment insurance in Canada. But that's, you know, unemployment insurance and pensions for everybody have become, through practice and through time, the federal part, the part in the federal government's court. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we could extend those and extend that kind of payment. And, and now we have the, the child benefit to a universal payment for everybody. There is a field where we wouldn't have to do that province by province negotiated agreement by negotiated agreement, the federal government could come in with, there would be some role for the province. The provinces always have something to say in this country, but where the federal government would be holding the steering wheel and would, would be have the capacity to really steer this program along. In the case of childcare, I mean, the fact of the matter is that childcare is considered to be by our constitution, something like education. Education is unambiguously and unequivocally a provincial responsibility. Unlike many other federations, like as Canada is, we don't even have a, a federal minister of education. The Americans have a federal secretary of education. We would never do that. The Krejcian government wanted to get involved a little bit in education. They set up a kind of institute in education, and then they, they finally abolished it. They thought it was a waste of money. And they got involved just by funding um, professors through Canada research chairs or giving out scholarships to universities. So that we're going to have an endless negotiation if they're going to really push childcare through with premiers like Doug Ford and Jason Kenney and Brad Wall, not oh, Brad Wall, uh, I forgot his name now, that's a sketchy one, the new guy, he's not so new anymore, and your friend in Alberta, I mean, they're going to have, and your friend in Manitoba, they're going to have a hell of a negotiation. Ideologically, these, Scott and Hull, thank you, to remember in Saskatchewan, we're going to have a big, big task. I mean, the Atlantic provinces are likely to go along with it. And certainly British Columbia would go along. And Quebec already has uh, universal child care. So, but there, I think 
the federal government has not focused and, and said, where can we act and act quickly and make a difference now? They're looking only at what they can talk about and what they can put in the window as advertising and as promotion, not where they can really have an impact on people's lives the, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. All right, thanks, Carl. Shuka, uh, just, uh, just, just uh, again, folks, the, the question we're dealing with came from the uh, Sandra Kerr in the audience. Shuka, so, what do you think? It was, uh, how does the budget deal with women's unpaid, underpaid, um, and essential services? Um, yeah, I think that, as Leah mentioned, there's a, uh, an incredible amount of work that provides critical benefits to people, um, and, and, and including intangible benefits, uh, but that isn't recognized as valuable within a sort of profiteering economic systems of the capitalist economic system. Um, include, that includes, of course, care, caregiving work, uh, an incredible amount of interpersonal work, an incredible amount of um, social education that isn't explicitly like mathematics or science, but about um, navigating the world, interacting with other people, problem solving, things like that. Um, all of these things that happen that are a part of uh, growth and, and maturation and, and sort of coming into the person that you will be throughout your life, those things aren't deemed uh, productive. And so they aren't sort of seen as worthy of investment. I think that that is, it, it absolutely um, omits uh, huge, huge, huge sectors of labor that are critical uh, to the to the well-being of people. And it is um, necessarily gendered in that uh, the majority of the work that isn't recognized is work that is gendered, is disproportionately provided by women. Um, so I think though, the, the one point I, I did want to make is, uh, I think the, the sort of the, the issue of um, the comment that I made before regarding the framing of the uh, childcare program, I think that that same issue comes up with your considering unemployment insurance or pensions, uh, because both of those are are transfer programs that are predicated upon the, the recipient working, right? Providing wage labor. And, uh, and so fundamentally, it's still kind of feeding into the notion of work or starve. And the pension is based on you having worked, right? And unemployment insurance is based on you having worked and you will be working again. And these are it's always um, uh, work that is in a, in a primarily uh, profit-seeking labor environment, a, a labor environment dominated by for-profit organizations. So I don't think it's sort of, it, it's, I don't think it's beneficial to think of that kind of work as neutral because it isn't. It's a kind of work that feeds certain things in the world and doesn't feed others. And so um, I think that structuring someone's access to well-being, whether it's directly or tangentially, structuring someone's access to well-being to their ability to provide wage labor is um, both sort of morally condemnable and like structurally flawed. I don't think it's uh, beneficial or sustainable. I just, can I just leap in? I just want to, again, I'm going to sound like somebody defending the status quo. In Canada, unlike the United States, we do have two kinds of pensions for people of my age and generation and the, and the rest of you get here, you would qualify too. So we have the Canada Pension Plan or Quebec, the Quebec Pension Plan, which is a contributory employers and employees and the government have contributed to build up this fund and it's geared to whatever your based on what your earnings were through your life and how many, what your contribution level was. We also have the old age security. It's actually an older, we used to call it simply the old age pension. And it's a, a fixed amount uh, that goes to everybody over a certain age, uh, and that it, for people with a higher income, it's clawed back in part or totally through the tax system. We also have for people below a, the poverty line, an additional payment called the guaranteed income supplement. So that when a person, let's say a person who's on provincial social assistance graduates to old age security at the age of 65, their income goes up because usually because they're gonna get these two, pay it is not a lot of money, but it may come to, something like around $15,000 a year. We're not gonna say that's gonna make, it, make, it, make anybody rich, but that is what uh, a person can get if they, let's say have, they had no income, they have no property and they, they are on social assistance and then they turn 65, they're entitled to get both of those uh, federal payments. But in a way that's the model for what Leah says to Fed. So Hugh Siegel, who was a conservative, uh, conservative former Senator uh, is sort of on the same campaign as Leah for a guaranteed income, maybe not the same kind, maybe a conservative version, but he would he would always point that out. We have a guaranteed livable income or a guaranteed basic income. Maybe it's not really guaranteed livable, but a guaranteed income for senior citizens. And we have in a sense eliminated 
the most dire poverty among senior citizens. When I was a young journalist, I did a story about senior citizens in Montreal eating dog food, eating cat food, not able, to, if, people, if somebody needed medicine, they didn't eat. They could have medicine and not eat. They had rats oh. in their apartments. So we have made life better for them uh, that way. You segued into a, you, into a very good question by um, a member of the audience. Uh, Don is, is uh, saying that uh, elder care is a disgrace in this country. He says there are more women working to help aging and sick, and sick parents than women staying home to raise their children, yet the budget had billions for child care and only a token amount for elder care. So why? Well, I think j just to, to pipe in here, I think, you know, uh, seniors in this country were not well cared for prior to the pandemic. We knew th of these issues prior to the pandemic. Uh, certainly uh, the uh, crisis in long-term care homes certainly highlighted it. But I mean, we have all sorts of issues uh, in this country where we're not properly caring for seniors, whether it's economic abuse of seniors, uh, elders abuse, uh, you know, going back to what uh, Carl was talking about, people choosing between eating dog food and living, I, I would argue it's, it's at that point uh, in this country. We have guaranteed income programs, not guaranteed livable basic incomes. There's so many seniors, even in my riding, that are living in total poverty, choosing between medication and rent on the verge of being unsheltered. This is abhorrent, especially in a country that gives billions and billions of dollars. I can't tell you how offensive I find it that this government has given 18 billion dollars to TMX pipeline something with zero net profit margin and we have seniors on the verge of of being unsheltered or already unsheltered uh, in this country and we don't really see a light uh, this government gave a $300 one-time payment uh, to seniors uh, during uh, the pandemic um, uh, you know, many whom did not benefit. I mean, that works out to just a couple of bucks uh, every month. Uh, it's time that we increase the guaranteed income or income supplement for seniors, not this two-tiered system this current government has set up that where people get an increase in benefit when they're 75. Uh, you know, I asked the minister, where did, what research did you base this on that, you know, you should, that you, the top up should be at 75. You know, we need to make sure that seniors are given what they need. Uh, we need to take the income guarantee, make it livable in addition to current and future government uh, supports and services, including things like pharmacare. You know, the fact that seniors don't have universal pharmacare, even seniors in this country, um, needs to change. Sorry, no, I get thanks. worked up about this. No, it's just, what, it's terrible. What all right. It's ter what all right. It's terrible. What all right. No, thanks, Leah. Chuka, what do you think? How, how did the budget, um, uh, what did it do for, uh, for our elders? Our elders? Um, I mean, I think, uh, again, similarly, it just like does not recognize, sufficiently recognize their existence, doesn't provide for dignity enough. Um, I, uh, um, no, the, the, I think the, the issue or, okay, so one of the issues with um, those sort of additional income supports coming in at 75 or even at 65, as Carl mentioned, is of course, the wealthier you, the wealthier you are, the longer you live. And so to say that there are, for the government to say, oh, well, you know, these, these if someone sort of reaches the age of, of retirement, then they get these additional programs, you still have to reach the age of retirement. And if you experience poverty your entire life, that is I mean, it's not like a neutral thing to say that that will happen. So um, I think it's 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 sort of still has those those same uh, critical problems in that it's still tying a lot to uh, the the either the provision of late wage labor or the sort of classification as of working age. Um, I think the other the other thing somebody in the I I apologize I missed your name but a comment from the audience identified that uh, women make less money on average throughout their entire working life. So whenever pensions or retirement uh, uh, resources or anything like that is based on income or tied to income, it necessarily will also have those gendered and racial inequities. And so I, I think that it's uh, another demonstration that it's anything any kind of uh, system that is meant to guarantee people's well-being that has any any um, dependence upon one having provided labor in the past or providing in the future, I think is fundamentally flawed. All right, thanks, Erica. All right, we're, uh, we are getting near the end. We have time for one last question, so, and I'll ask you folks to kind of like the, the lightning round, man, keep it tight, but 
Um, most, uh, this is an audience question, most of Canada's pre precarious workforce are racialized. Many that worked at the Cargill uh, meatpacking industry, that's the one in, uh, in, uh, in, Al in Al Al Alberta, uh, were, are Filipino, for instance. How was this addressed? Uh, racialized workers being the most of our precarious workforce. Um, so uh, let's just go in reverse. I could, we'll start with you this time and then go to, to uh, Carl and let Leia finish. Um, I don't think it was. I think the only way to address the emergence and, as Carl identified, the increasing prominence of precarious work is by, one, and proactively classifying all workers as employees, ensuring that they're covered by employment standards of access to unionization, and two, proactively enforcing that legislation. Uh, I don't think the government has indicated a, a desire to do any of those things. They have a consultation, or they open a consultation on uh, precarious workers in federally regulated industries that was... Uh, and from my perspective, not clear enough to produce coherent policy suggestions based on on inputs, uh, or and so um, it's it's not clear to me what the government, what the federal government's perception of precarious work is. Uh, but you know, without question, they haven't. I don't think they've even begun to address precarious work in in Canada, generally speaking. So uh, you know, in no case, in no way, have they gone into the issue and and uh, begun to address the racialized component of it. Thanks, Dr. Carl. Over to you. So, well, you know, I talked about this before that we have two issues. One, the government uh, is going slow and negotiating. I think this government ha wants to have an image of being the nice guys and the caring people, but that the people who have their ear privately are corporate interests. And um, so there is a lot of private, quiet pushback against increasing costs for business. Uh, I mean, you know, as we come out of the pandemic and we talk about how this is going to be a great spur to increase measures to reduce inequality in the corporate side, they say, no, uh, we've already, we're bleeding, our profits are bleeding. We need to, we need to keep up our profit picture. We need to keep competitive with other similar countries. And then there's the other issue that a lot of workers are at the mercy of the Doug Fords and Jason Kenney's and Scott Moles of the world. They're working for instance, the cargo workers in Alberta, they're within the jurisdiction of the Alberta government. So the federal government, a really forceful federal government would find ways to almost shame and embarrass the provinces when it was their jurisdiction and they weren't making sure these workers are treated well and would move more aggressively where it has jurisdiction. But it's backpedaling its, its initiatives where it has jurisdiction and it is never, never uh, taking on the provinces or, or standing up for people who are within the provincial jurisdiction. So it's a pretty, um, a pretty sorry situation. The only thing to do is people have to really, uh, in during election campaigns or whatever, keep raising these issues and pointing out the cognitive dissonance between a government that talks like it cares about everybody and that it's a, a well-meaning, caring government, feminist government, and then uh, point to the actual results and the actual initiatives that they're taking. Thank you, Carl. And Leah, over to you for the last word. How do you think this budget, um, was it done for uh, precarious workers who are mostly racialized? Well, I think, I think they've failed and I think it goes beyond the budget. I mean, going back to what I shared before, I mean, we have to look at, uh, you know, essential workers. Uh, you mentioned Carkill, many uh, who come from the Filipino community. Uh, we heard horror stories of migrant workers in Ontario uh, living in shoe boxes, uh, living off food rations. You know, uh, we need to ensure that all workers are uh, protected, and that includes ensuring that they have proper immigration status, so they can't be exploited by by employers. Uh, who place lives at risk. I mean, you know, you look at meat packing plants, uh, you know, uh, care work, you know, um, mm -hmm. frontline care work. Uh, where's the protection for workers? And uh, I think it's part of it's uh, certainly, you know, we don't see it in the budget, but we also don't see it in the kind of policies, including immigration policies uh, that um, uh, certainly perpetuate systems of systemic racism. So, you know, I think we have a lot of work to do to protect workers. And we, we also have to begin looking at um, all the systems that are in place that place 
workers at risk. And I think it goes beyond just money. I think we have real systemic issues, uh, racist issues with systemic racism that we have to deal with uh, in this country. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists for those excellent answers and for, um, um, yeah, enlightening us on, 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 on on the effects or lack of effects or effectiveness of the budget. So um, that is all the time we have for questions today. Um, so yeah, thanks so much to our panelists, Carl Nuremberg, Leigh Gazan, and Chukia Jekum. Um, before I turn the last word over to my co-host Libby Davies, I wanna give a big shout out to Rabble for uh, organizing Off the Hill, especially on this 20th anniversary uh, and encourage everyone to make a donation to support uh, future panels. Now, over to you Libby. Uh, thanks so much, Robin. Well, that was a really great panel tonight. Great questions. And uh, I love that you all have so much insight. So thank you. Uh, it was just, it went by really fast. It was great to hear all the discussion. And, you know, we do want to hear from viewers and what you'd like us to focus on at Rabble in the next June Off the Hill panel. Uh, these are going to be regular panels. Uh, the next one will be in June. So what, it, what, what kinds of issues do you want to see come up? So please share your thoughts in the chat here on the Zoom. And to stay connected and to get updates on future shows, just sign up to Rabble's free weekly email news alerts at rabble.ca backslash alerts. So folks, that's all for tonight. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Robin. You did a great job. And we look forward to seeing you the next time. Bye, everybody.